Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, a show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. The only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its net commissions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations dedicated to fighting climate change. Keith, pleasure to meet you, man. Thanks so much for taking the time on Black Friday to join me for a lovely conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. My absolute pleasure. And we always love to get the podcast started with a bit of background on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the moment. Well, uh, I actually started in a completely different industry of where I am now. I started in the oil industry right out of college, spent about a decade there and then moved into the medical devices industry. Uh, And I spent a few decades in medical devices and I was basically in the operating room, supporting surgeons for advanced procedures. And, you know, you can get a lot of personal gratification out of doing that kind of work. You're impacting people's lives and very positively. So I had a really terrific career there, but something was missing. And I was trying to figure out what's my give back. You know, what is it that I'm going to do to for my society that really has an impact um, positively that that doesn't necessarily impact me individually? And as I was trying to figure out my give back and I, I spent um, a good chunk of my late 30s and early 40s trying to figure out what this was going to be, I came to the conclusion I wanted it to be in my home state of Maine. And I wanted it to be on the coastline. We've got a lot of issues going on on our coastline right now that we need to address. And, you know, it's the public commons, right? So it's not really getting addressed extraordinarily well. Um, no one person is responsible for it. It's something that we all have to take some responsibility for. So once I decided I wanted to do something there on the water, on our coastline in Maine, I educated myself, I took a course, I tried to figure out what is it that I can do. And I found that some, one of the most critical species in our waters uh, is, is a mollusk. It's a filtering animal, it's um, oysters, because oysters not only filter water, but they also create reefs. And when they create a reef, it's a structure in the water that has so many benefits. It's been now studied in, in, and documented in a plethora of papers where it brings an enormous amount of life to the area. It supports nurseries. It mitigates uh, erosion on our coastline from, you know, you, as you can imagine, oyster reefs will hold back wave action it sequesters carbon. They sequester carbon in their shells. The list of benefits of an oyster reef are just mind boggling. So that's what I wanted to do. And I had to educate myself on it and get experienced at growing oysters. I went out once a week with my father um, as a hobby, trying to learn about oysters, put a boat on the ocean, learn basic seamanship at the same time because after all you can't show up from the medical devices industry and expect to just start pointing in this direction and that (laughs) right so i had to find out who the players were who the people are that can help um, help me develop projects where i can build oyster reefs plant eelgrass help rebuild our marine ecosystem improve the water quality. And so uh, that's how, that's what got me here. And then I decided, hey, I can turn this into a business too. I can sell these animals. They're, they're an amazing source of protein. They're doing good work on the water while they're in the water. And so I created a business around this. And that's kind of where I am today. Now I'm just starting to scale up this business. It's awesome, man. And I'm excited to get into all of it. Uh, I do want to talk about this idea of the give back a little bit more. How long were you in the the oil and gas industry? About a decade. About a decade. So this, you might be surprised to hear this from like a huge climate advocate, but I do feel like 
oil and gas. They've give they have given so much to the community. The entire society has changed from this, you know, amazing source of energy. Um, it's just something like I, there's a lot of corruption and stuff, but it's something not to be forgotten. So, I mean, I feel like you do pr- you were providing a great value to the society when working in that industry. But I'm curious if your introduction into the um, medical services or medical sales or medical technology industry was kind of motivated by this idea that you wanted to be helping promote products that give back to people as well. And I'm interested, like how you kind of maybe became disenchanted with that and wanted to really get into like nature. I'm just curious, like where that thought process came from. Yeah, well, you know, growing up in Maine, hunting and fishing since I was a youngster, I was very connected to the earth, frankly. And working for the oil industry paid the bills. But And I liked the technical aspects of it. When I would Mm -hmm. walk into a factory and I could see how they were producing products, I just got really wound up in that technical aspect of it. It's fun. You get to to problem solve. Um, But the industry, you know, the industry really needs to be petering out, frankly. Of course. uh, Of course, exactly. It was and continues to be a super important energy source for us, but it's having detrimental effect on our planet and the species on our planet. So we just flat out need to find better sources of energy. It's just that simple. Getting into medical devices was, you know, it tapped into my, it tapped into my, um, that technical aspect of me that likes to problem solve. And I got a, I got a taste of it when I, when I saw what they were doing in the operating room, frankly, I mean, if you are promoting the right products, if you're working with the right company, you get to have a serious impact in a surgery. You know, the, the surgeons doing these procedures really rely upon you to understand your, not just your product, but what could go wrong, you know, and, and how, and when you are the representative of that company, that product, and you're going to all of these different teaching institutions in New England, in, Bo- in the Boston area, you're seeing some of the very best perform surgery and they want to know what's she doing what's he doing and you just get to be very much connected um, to a really positive a positive um, service being offered to the society so it it was really fun for a very long time Mm -hmm. really cool Okay. So that kind of, so you said you like tinkering with things, not right. Like kind of understanding how systems work. Yeah. You know, I love, I think I'm at my, at my heart, I'm an entrepreneur and an innovator. And what happened here more recently in being out on the water was that when I decided that I was going to make this a business as well as a give back, it really changed my mindset. You know, I, I got really critical of how people were growing oysters and I started to break it down and figure out, well, well, you know, how do people actually make money at it? Because I hadn't thought about it until that point. And this was like three years ago or so. The thing about oyster farming is that it's all about the labor. Today, if you're growing oysters, you're growing them in some kind of a cage or a bag or a basket. And you have to access that cage bag or basket to empty them out and to refill them. You're lifting the bag or basket up to the side of the boat, opening it up. If it's a cage, it may have six different bays in it. You're pulling six different bags out of it. Each bag could weigh 35, 40 pounds. If it has market ready oysters in it. This is backbreaking work. Yeah. And I haven't had a person on my farm that hasn't had a back injury at some point from doing this kind of work, a slip on the deck of the boat while you're trying to lift a 300 pound cage onto the hooks that are off the side of the boat. So it's about the labor. Yeah. And what I found when I started talking an informal survey of other farms because we have a, you know, around 150 farms on the coastline of Maine, and about 130 of them are probably just one or two 
maybe three people working on the farm. These are small family farms, all of them. It's just fantastic. Great. Yeah, absolutely. The problem is the vast, vast majority of them, they're holding second jobs because they're just not generating enough profit from the business to make that a career, a full-time job. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, you, the, the, the bottleneck is labor itself. And, and on an oyster farm, a suspended aquaculture oyster farm, meaning something that's being suspended at the surface of the water column with flotation, uh, you're limited to around 150 to maybe 300,000 oysters per year per worker. That's just, that's it. That's all you can get. And, and the 300,000 is typically the larger companies that have, you know, they've put in place some of their own um, unique mechanizations because they have the they have the size to do that. The economies mm-hmm. of scale to buy two boats and put a, a a unique flipper of the baskets, you know, in between the two boats. And but the vast majority of us don't have those kind of resources. Don't have that economies of scale where we can invest in that kind of capital. So, <clears throat> you know, when I identified this problem, this bottleneck, which is labor, and then I look at where I grew up in, in Maine, where we grow potatoes, um, we've already done this, right? I mean, we've already done this even on land. We've mechanized our farming. We're not heading out into the field with a wheelbarrow and a hoe and a, and a shovel anymore. Now, I value small, sustainable farms that are not monoculture. I think it's absolutely fantastic, but you also have to learn, you have to figure out how to make money. Right. So as I was trying to figure out how do I mechanize some of these processes really it comes down to three different activities we're doing on the farm that accounts for 80 percent to 90 percent of our workload we should be able to find a way to to mechanize those three tasks absolutely turns out i didn't have to figure it out i found a youtube video of all things classic just I just couldn't even believe it when I was watching it. I was thinking, if this exists, I need, I need to have it. It was a gentleman in, in New Zealand. And I flew over to New Zealand to see this guy, to spend time on his farm. And I was just what? blown away. I needed, I needed proof that it was transferable back to the waters of our coastline. You know, that was it his YouTube channel? It was. And you just reached out to him on YouTube or how did you get in contact with him? I, um, I, uh, let me see, was it a phone call or an email? It was an email to him. It was initially an email and he responded and yeah, I said, on his website. Yeah. And that was it. And he wasn't, um, he was doing it on his own farm and he was starting to build a commercial business around it, but he hadn't done it yet. He was just starting. He was just starting. Someone in New so, Zealand growing something besides sheep. It's unique. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've got a huge aquaculture industry, actually. They're yeah, way ahead of the United States. They've got um, green mussels over there that are just absolutely delicious. It's a huge industry. And that's where he got his start, actually, putting in anchoring systems for the green mussel industry. And then yeah. he's started an oyster farm and it was kind of a farming system for a larger oyster farm. So he was growing 20 million oysters. He grows 20 million oysters a year and then sells them at about two and a half inches to be finished off by a larger farm. Interesting. So he, you know, he had, he had to do all the same stuff we had to do. You know, his, his workers had to bend over the side of the boat and flip the cages or baskets or bags. He was using a bagging system, floating bags. They hated the task. Sounds heavy. They regretted it when they had to do it. They had to lift the bags into the boat when they wanted to empty them, right? And then they had to do something with the bag after they emptied it. 
it, there were just a whole, whole number of issues that he wanted to solve, including lost gear on the water. Because if you're growing 20, 20 million oysters a year, you have a lot of gear on the water. And you don't have to lose a you know, high percentage of that gear for it to have an impact on the shoreline. So he was trying to figure out how do I make a more robust system as well. And he came up with this just brilliant idea. The elegant solution in this idea was to put a piece of PVC on top of the suspended cage, in this case, a basket, a hexel basket that comes up, it's manufactured in Australia. So he's got this PVC on top of it that works as an axle and you put rope directly through that piece of PVC. Can, can we pause? Like, I don't understand exactly. Do you like plant the oysters in like a cage or do, are they swimming around in the ocean and they go into the cage or do they grow on rocks? Are they different from mussels? I don't, I actually don't know right. too, too much. Yeah. Right. I should have started there. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> uh, oysters are, so they start as free swimming larvae. Okay. You know, they're, they're released into the water column with a plume of sperm and eggs from the oysters when they procreate and they're free swimming and then they attach to some substrate anything right anything they can attach to that's why it's actually really important to have structure in the mm. water even if it's just rocks because if they land on silt mud they're gonna drop down into the silt and they're gonna die yeah okay so but in aquaculture, we don't rely upon that. We have hatcheries do that for us. So they, they create, you know, hundreds of millions of oyster spat is what it's called. When it's in it, it after its free swimming stage, it attaches to, they actually pulverize old oyster shells. Oh. So they, they, the, this, Free swimming larvae attaches to a tiny little speck of an oyster shell and starts to build its shell around that. Beautiful. So now they're not actually attached to something. They keep the water moving. They keep good food and nutrient in the water for that spat. And they grow that spat up to, you know, maybe a two, three millimeters in size. So it looks like a large grain of sand. Hmm. And then you get all of the spat and you put it into a mesh enclosure some some I, kind I of a bag okay and then you'd put it in something that would hold it in the water column or you could drop it to the seafloor there are lots of different ways to farm you could choose to grow it up to a certain size and then disperse it freely on the seafloor and rake them up to harvest them and there are just lots of ways to grow oysters in the ocean but one of the more um, economically productive ways is to keep it up near the surface of the water because that's where the water is warmer and there's a lot of nutrient there as well. So they're eating voraciously when the water is warmer. They're, they're becoming more dormant as the water gets colder, they eat less, right? So we want them where the water is warmer. So the way you keep them up there is they're kind of like bundled in these, there's like these bundles of like clumps of like I guess what used to be shells and there's like these larvae attached to them and they're and you're keeping them at the surface of the water with like giant like bags or containers or what or what? Yeah, just picture a picture a picture a picture a bag, picture a picture a rigid bag though, a plastic rigid bag or a basket. And it's it has mesh that allows for the water to flow through it. And the mesh is small enough so that your oysters don't fall out. Got now it. the, the shell they attached to, they were so small when they did that. It's not, you can't tell that they're attached to anything at all. By the time we're getting them as an aquaculturist, they look like a tiny little oyster. That's all. Got and it. they're not attaching to each other. We don't want them to do that because these are for sale. So we want them to stay individual unattached to their fellow oysters. So we're, they're all individual oysters put into a bag and they're kind of sloshing around at the surface of the water and filtering water. Got it. Okay, cool. So PVC pipe with like a, you said there's something going through the middle kind of thing. 
Yeah. And that, like I was saying, that's kind of the simple but elegant solution to uh, making a more robust system because it's protecting the rope that goes through it. But also it put that basket on a swivel. Right. That's now on a swivel. You could just turn it around. And, and then this clever gentleman, Aaron Panel from, from uh, New Zealand, who, by the way, just won uh, an award for his innovation. Um, he then decided, hey, why, I don't have to lean over the side of the boat to flip these over. Right. I, 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 I can put something off the side of my boat, some kind of piece of metal that will encourage them to flip over as I drive my boat along. It hits the baskets the right way. It kind of turns them. It's, a, it's called a helical flipper, it, the helix flipper. It has like a helical shape to it. Um, and, and think of a roller coaster track. So it comes into the roller coaster track and it does a 180 turn and comes off the back of that in a new position. It's now in the drying position. So this float that was holding it at the top of the water is now underneath the basket. The basket is above it. The basket is above the water. It's, the oysters are no longer feeding. Right. And the reason that you do this is because anything that's put in the ocean has, you know, it's susceptible to biofouling. I mean, just imagine, just think about any images you've had of anything at the seafloor of the ocean that's been there for any period of time at all. It has all kinds of stuff that's collected on it from barnacles and mussels to algae and <clears throat> everything, everything that lives in the ocean, frankly. We need to burn that off once a mm. week. We need to get that aired out so that they don't, all the barnacles and mussels and other creatures don't actually block all of those mesh holes and prevent the water flow through the basket, which is the food source for those oysters. Wow. So in the past, people were pulling these baskets out on maybe even a weekly basis for millions of growing oysters, right? And you're cleaning the, the basket out consistently? You're, you're, you're with the old system, you're leaning over the side of your boat or you're getting right into the water. And you're flipping those baskets or cages or bags over manually. Yeah. Every but like single one of all them the time. Like all weekly. the time. Yeah. Once a week. Once a week. And then you're coming back 24 hours later, or maybe in some cases 48 hours later, and you're flipping them all back over into the feeding position again. Yeah. Imagine, right? So now you understand the, this is one of the you know, activities, one of the tasks on an oyster farm. But this is why labor is the bottleneck to having a sustainable business where you can actually produce enough oysters so that you can make enough profit so you don't have to have a second job so that you can actually save enough money because after all, you'll need an emergency, an emergency fund. You, this is a farming operation. Something's going to go wrong. It's not only a farming operation, it's a farming operation on the ocean. So, you know, you're going to have issues hit you at some point, whether it be, you know, weather related or if it's a dangerous algal, algae bloom. We're seeing more and more of those, right, with, with the warming of our water. So this is how you get to enough production for a small family farm to where it can actually be a livelihood. So how... So I imagine you started the business uh, without this flip system and you recently you've implemented it and how have you seen it change and how long were you doing it manually versus with uh, how long have you been doing it with the flip system? Yeah, right. So I started as a hobby, right? And I wasn't really trying to bring it to scale and make money at it. I wasn't selling my oysters for the first four or five years. And then I started selling oysters about three years ago and the way it has impacted my farm uh, it, it allowed me to go from a 150,000 oysters of production per year to a million. That's insane. I know. I know that's, that's it right there. That's it. That's the absolute critical component to making this a sustainable business for a small farm. So one person, 
2,080 hours per year, you can land a million oysters a year with this system. Now, if you can land a million oysters a year, now you have a legitimate profit center. And here's where it gets really interesting, in my opinion. This is where this is the part that starts to excite me. After, after that, what are you going to do? I think you've attracted this new like culture to the ocean, by the way. We are not commercial fisher people, right? We're not a part of the commercial fisheries. We're farmers on the water. And it's a different culture. You're not a hunter, you're a farmer. These people share. If you got all of the bivalve and algae farmers in the state of Maine in a room and you were asked where to ask them, okay, you know, who has volunteered out on the ocean? Nearly every single person is going to raise their hand. That's the kind of culture that it's a new and different culture that's coming out to our waters. Um, they're sharers of information and equipment. It's just, it's, it's, it's the culture of farming. So now if you give an entrepreneur money and time, which is what happens now with the, once you employ a system on the water where you can actually grow enough oysters to where you can have enough profit. Now this person's going to have money and time. And they came to the waters for all the right reasons. They're producing a product out on the water that filters nearly 50 gallons of water per day. It clarifies the water, right? It takes sediment and particulate matter out of the water column. It allows for sunlight to reach lower into the water. And that drives the flora on the seafloor, producing more oxygen, producing more places for natural occurring nurseries, which have been depleted along our coastline right? It counteracts eutrophication from runoff of nitrogen and phosphorus into our waters. That's a healthy food source for an oyster. When you hear oysters are filter feeders, that may be really, that, you know, phosphorus and nitrogen may be damaging. It is damaging. It's what has depleted or at least been a, a big reason for the depletion of our eel grasses and other sea grasses but it's a healthy food source for an oyster. So there's a symbiotic relationship out there between these species. And we've seen an explosion of seagrasses under our farm. And I think a lot of farms would report the same. What other species are you seeing that are appearing because of these oysters? And then what kind of benefits are they having? Have you seen like a measurable change in the ecosystem around your farm? Oh my God, because of yeah. the increased production. I mean, they're talking about almost 10 xing the amount of oysters in the area. Yeah, yeah, I, you could easily 10 x. You could easily 10 x. So, um, yeah, we see from when we first got there, it was kind of barren. Frankly, it was a a muddy bottom, very little on it, and now everything wants to live in and around our gear. We have rock gunnel fish in every basket. They lay their eggs in our baskets. We see the, the embryos hatch in our baskets. Um, tons of crabs, uh, grass shrimp, um, and pretty much every amphipod you can possibly imagine. Everything's crawling all over your hands and arms when you're working out on the water. It's incredible, the life that it brought to our farm. Incredible. So now I don't, think that's where we should end. So what I was kind of getting at is like, okay, yes, we're definitely doing a lot of good out there with our gear as aquaculturists, but as a community, we've got these people who are givers, right? Now, if they can employ these, a system, an actual farming system where they can increase production and they can make enough profit so that they have some money and time on their hands, they are going to innovate. They're going to they're gonna start creating things out on the water that are going to be spectacular. When you give an entrepreneur time and money, things happen, right? Totally. So I think what we're going to see is we're going to see 
we're going to see some vertical integration, yes, because that's what interests some people. They're going to want to build a business of distribution and they're going to want to build a restaurant because that's just fun and that's some people's passion. But then we're going to have a whole lot of other people that just want to be really good farmers and they're going to start bringing other species to their farm and really understand the more species that you can bring to the waters, the better off the waters. You could put you know, indigenous sea cucumbers in my state, you could put those on the seafloor and they're going to be cleaning up the seafloor. That's what they do, right? You could have kelp at the, at the outer edges of your farm. Maybe you're not a kelp farmer, but maybe the kelp farmer can work with you and come over and harvest that on occasion. And there are things that love the taste of kelp in the ocean as well. And some of that um, old or rotting kelp can be, can be a, a nutrient source for just a whole bunch of different species. Um, sea urchin for one in particular. So you could have all of these different species on your farm because you have money. And because you now have time, you can't do this if you don't have time and money. Some of those species, they may be commercial. Welk, for example, you could put welk on your farm, which is a type of snail, and hmm. they eat barnacles. Well, barnacles are a nuisance to an aquaculturist. It'd be nice to have species on the farm that eat barnacles, but they also could be sold commercially at relatively low volumes. You could have clams on your farm as well. I'm starting to introduce new species to my farm. But the point I'm kind of getting at is that you're going to find people in this business. That's their mindset. They're environmentalists at heart. That's why they're out on the water growing bivalves and algae. So now they're going to have money and time. They're going to create some pretty spectacular spaces for, for naturally occurring nurseries. They're going to clarify the water with all of these bivalves. They're going to have symbiotic relationships working between these different species. And at the heart of why I started this, I hope we'll also see projects, just give back projects. Like at the mouths of rivers. In the state of Maine, we're starting to open up some of our rivers, remove dams, which is just critical. I mean, you can't dam up a river and expect that the anadromous finfish species are gonna survive because that's where they go to spawn, right? And then they come back out to the sea. We're talking about anadromous fish like um, smelt and salmon. They're running up rivers to spawn and then they go back out and live their life in the ocean. So I envision uh, like at, at, the, at the mouth of the Presumpscot River where I grew up in that area, it looks like a dead zone out there as you're driving along the coastline and you look out to it. It's just a flat of mud and there's just nothing there. Imagine it now with all kinds of oyster reefs and eelgrass bringing just a ton of life to that area and then stocking that river or continuing to stock that river with anadromous fish species, making sure they have a way to their spawning grounds, you're going to have a, a tenfold impact on rebuilding your marine ecosystem by, doing, by putting in some of these structural components so that, yeah, I mean, you can stock a river, but if you don't look at from the ground up of your ecosystem and how they all interact with each other, all these different species and the structure itself, then you're not going to be able to rebuild it. So I think the money and the time given to these people who are our entrepreneurs and environmentalists out on the water right now is going to be, uh, it's going to be huge for the state of Maine, for our waters and for everybody. I just, I'm like enthralled by the way you're looking at this whole system. I think it's incredible. I'm so glad that you're doing it. I'm, I'm so happy to be able to like elevate your voice on my show. I, th I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, I'm curious if you find that your customers 
are in a similar mindset as you. I'm, I'm like, I'm wondering, do you do your own distribution? Are you, and are you finding that consumers um, actually care about who's growing the oysters that they're eating? I think they do. I think they do. I think it's been a large part for the revitalization of oysters in the marketplace. And we are seeing a growth in oyster consumption, not anywhere near where it used to be, but it's growing. And I find that people who are out kayaking and boating, recreational boaters, whenever they come around my farm, they're just dying to hear the story. What, what got you out here? And how do you grow them? And can I see what a little one looks like? And people care. You know, people care about the environment. People care about how to grow things. And I'm finding that the customers, um, you know, they want to know the name of the farm. They want it to be a small family farm. Mm -hmm. They want to have an impact when they go into a restaurant and they pay a lot of money for an oyster. They want to, they want to know where it's coming from. So, yeah, I think, I think it's really connected to the consumer in that way. That's great. Um, I know you were on the news. Have you found any other local farms kind of implementing the system that you've kind of whatever sh sh been shared from New Zealand? And then, I, yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts on like cooperating with other people doing similar things. Yeah. Yeah. This is, you know, this I think is at the core of this particular industry cooperation. I think we have a chance to do something unique here on the water that we just aren't really able to do on land and in other industries. By that, I mean, build cooperatives, share resources, share labor from farm to farm, share equipment. But I will say that this system presents a challenge as much as it presents an opportunity. Because if you're a small farmer, if you're, if you're a farmer on the coastline of Maine, frankly, you have another job and you really want to do this, but you can't quite jump in with two feet. You're buying a small amount of gear, baskets or bags or cages, and you're putting them, putting them on the water maybe putting a hundred thousand oyster seed into that gear and then they start to grow. And so you buy another 20, 30 cages and now you're in year two and you're trying to keep up with the growth and now you've got to add another five or 10 cages because they're growing and they're filling their bags and you've got to split them up into two or three bags now. Right. But you can see the process. It's a little bit of money at a time but you're kind of caught in a loop of poverty, frankly, in the, to a great extent, because you're never going to get to that critical mass where you can actually make enough money to leave the job that you're doing and make this the career that you want it to be. But the challenge for being able to grow a million oysters a year is that you need to put enough gear on the water to grow a million oysters a year. And you've never had to do that. And so it's expensive to do that. You know, this is, if you want to grow a million oysters, you have to spend somewhere around three hundred to $400,000. Can't get a mortgage on oyster farms, huh? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, the, the capital equipment pays back very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, as, it, it could pay back in really by the end of your first year in most That's incredible uh, most but it's the first year of sales so if you're in warm waters like down the southern coastline in the southeastern united states or in the gulf of mexico you can bring an oyster from two millimeters to its market size and sell it in as little as nine months in some places but in the state of maine because the water's are so much colder, it takes us between two and three years for most farmers, between two and three years to get the right shell size, meat size, shell hardness. For my farm, they're almost all three-year-old oysters before I sell them. Wow. You know, we get our waters in Maine from the Arctic, right? Mm -hmm. So the, if, you, if you were to look at 
a, a map of the way water actually flows, you, there's water that circulates around Newfoundland. It comes around Canada, Nova Scotia, and it sweeps off the coast of Maine. And that is really nutrient-rich, Arctic, cold Arctic waters. And then coming from the south, you have a warm current right? That everybody else gets. And it runs right up the coastline. It even hits Massachusetts and it kind of swings off at that southern tip of Maine. So our waters are just much colder than everybody else's and it takes us longer to grow oysters. And the point, economically anyway, the point here is that you've got a lag. You could end up taking, you know, taking out a loan of $300,000 to put a system on the water, and you're not going to be selling those oysters for three years. So we need the support structures, the organizations like, uh, like CEI and Maine Technology Institute and our banks. Um, we need the financial support structure in our state to recognize this new challenge. If we want to have small, relatively small, you know, one to 10 workers on, you know, on per farm, then we're going to need to support these, these families with loans that actually make sense for the farming business they're getting into. There's going to be a three-year lag before they get any revenues to pay for it they you know a good portion of them might not even have the assets to collateralize that size of a loan so we're going to have this new challenge that we have to overcome but the benefits after you overcome that challenge the benefits are just phenomenal because now you have a coastline of many many farms not big and this isn't industrializing farming you, this is a small mechanized system that once you really, if you put four people to work on this mechanized system, this farming system, it's a turnkey kind of farming system. The fifth person doesn't have a whole lot to offer. The sixth person would be twiddling her thumbs and doing nothing. Okay. So this is a small unit. It's just perfect for having lots of small family farms. And the reason you'd want that is because that's how you build wealth, right? You, when you have major corporations that can come in and, you know, lease a hundred acres and, and uh, employ the cheapest labor possible, that's not how you build wealth. That's not how you build good jobs. That's not how you build good societies. So this particular mechanization this farming system, it really empowers the entrepreneur that we have on our waters right now. We just need to help that, you know, help them afford it, frankly, to put the system on the water. And they probably just love being out there. And then one thing I wanted to talk to you about is how your perspective has changed to, uh, you know, you talk about showing up at this this area in or this part of the the, sh the shoreline that is kind of just it was like murky, didn't have too much going on to not only creating a great source of protein for the humans living on land, but you get to be this, this fosterer of life, this steward of this part of, of the world. And it must have been really amazing to go from working in sales in two of the largest industries, you know, um, you know, health and energy to going to being like, like, oh, I'm just going to grow something. I'm going to create life in a community. How has that changed the way you like see the world? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I've, I feel like I'm, I feel like a part of it, frankly, I feel more connected to it. It's, I think you'd find probably a lot of farmers on land as well. They just feel very much connected to the land and this has been an incredible experience for me in connectivity. So it's changed. Um, it's changed my life dramatically, frankly. So I would wish this upon everybody, frankly.
get out on the water and be a part of this. I think we should be engaging our school systems to do this and let children go out there and build these oyster reefs and plant the eel grass with us and then, and then bring them back out the next year and, and uh, do a survey of the life that's in that same area, do a comparison. And you're going to feel this sense of, um, you've really made a difference because you can actually see it, you know? And I think we all need to be doing something like that in our lives where we're doing something for the greater good, for the public commons. And it's not necessarily just about us. And Ethan, you really, in our, when you and I were introducing ourselves to each other before this podcast, I think you really nailed it when you said that it's about how you live your life. It's about integrating these important things, these core values that you identify early on in your life. It took me longer than you, Ethan, to identify that. And this is where I get to give back. But, you know, I think that everybody, if they were impacted earlier in life in their in the school systems when they're younger, I think everybody would start integrating this kind of process and give back in their life as they're going along. You know, don't just amass wealth and then figure out how you're going to give it all back. That's not, that's not a, that's not a well life. That's not a good life lived. But if you, you want to feel like a sense of um, community and Personal gratification comes from giving back. I think we all know that. So yeah. You end, up, you end up being happier. Yeah, no, we, we, we all do know that on the inside, like they might say it's written on your heart. Um, we do seem to live in, in a society that emphasizes taking and extraction, but you're seeing this huge overswell based on necessity of people pushing back against this model and wanting to, wanting to find ways that they can live their life that is enriching the planet rather than just taking away from it. And I talk about the idea of service a lot on this show. It's, I it's think like it's the most meaningful way you can spend your time. And in this episode in particular, we talked about the idea of just the give. And one of, you know, the thing that people love most in their life is are their children where they're able to bring something into the world and continually give them opportunities, give them chances to go out and become better, to struggle or to do something uh, incredible. And I think that's uh, looks like I'm lagging a little bit. <laughs> looks, but um, that you know that's essentially what you do when you uh, you have a farm. You're, you're fostering life into the world. It's one of the most meaningful. I think everyone knows it's one of the most meaningful things uh, ways you can spend your time. So um, I think it's great, and I think uh, engaging the uh, the farming community is one of the best ways to to work on these environmental challenges. Which kind of brings me to my, one of my last questions: is like, what are your plans for adapting to a warming climate, and like, what advice do you have for other like aquaculture f- uh, farmers when it comes to this challenge? Yeah, um, well, we're in the right field to help, right, and it's my opinion that the more species you bring into the water, the better off the marine ecosystem will be. I think, I think we know that we've learned that, but when it comes to warming waters, you know, in the short term, believe it or not, it's actually going to help oysters. That particular species likes warmer waters. So, but a lot of species are going to be losers. And so we have to have some forethought here. I mean, we've seen, lobsters migrate off the shorelines of Connecticut and Massachusetts. I don't know why we wouldn't expect that will happen eventually in the state of Maine, as sad as it is, but it will most likely happen. And so what are we going to do? How are we going to replace that opportunity, that economic opportunity? And how are we going to mitigate that risk from continuing? Well, I think it's all about projects. I think, our, I think our Department of Marine Resources has an opportunity that is just phenomenal right now, but they're underfunded, of course, way underfunded and understaffed. But what you could do is create a project-based program for those who want to earn their living in the public commons out on the waters that are everybody's. It's a shared resource. 
So you have this new culture of people coming to the water that are ready to give. Why not implement projects? Okay, give back. We're going to build oyster reefs. You're an oyster farmer. You have the resources to do this. You have the experience that you, you have all of the tools needed. So the Department of Marine Resources should have all kinds of projects in mind, and we should be out there, we the farmers, we should be out there executing these projects for them. This is a multiplier effect that they need to take advantage of because they have it right now. They have this resource. So that's what I see in global warming um, when it comes to sea level rise, mitigation to the damages of our coastline. You have this new culture on the water and you need to, you need to harness it. You need to harness that power with project-based programs. Hmm. So that's what I'd like to see fa other farmers and our regulatory agencies thinking about. Think bigger. Think bigger. You do, we're not hunters out there just trying to take and, you know, try. I mean, if, you, if you're a hunter, you're not going to give away your favorite spot. And, and so you're not as much of a sharer. Right. So you now have sharers. You have this whole new culture. Take advantage of it. We're ready to do projects, but we need some funding. So I don't know where the funds are going to come from, but maybe we can find big donors. We have way too many billionaires on the planet these days. Maybe they should be funding some of these things. You know, maybe they'd like to. Maybe the, maybe the right billionaires listening to this podcast. We, we need... And, and this isn't, you know, this is, this is money for literally for the Department of Marine Resources, that organization that has scientists in place and regulatory responsibilities. They're the ones that need money to create these programs. Yeah. Maybe one day I'll be selling every single house in America and we'll have plenty of funding for all these amazing projects. That's the, that's the goal, hopefully. Yeah. But, uh, Keith, like it's been great having you on the show, man. I really love talking to people who are deeply enthralled with passion projects. And you can hear from everything you're saying, you found something that you really love. And it really, it obviously has an, a, a huge benefit to the environment around you. Not just, not just like non-human life, but every, the entire uh, community can be uh, positively affected by what you're doing. So thanks for taking the time. I just love to ask at the end, uh, any advice you have for like other family owned businesses that are doing similar work? Yeah, I think they need to reflect on how to, what, how much money they need to make. This is the important part, right? Of you have to make money. You, 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 you just simply have to pay your bills. So I would say, figure out what you need to make, understand the economics of it, and then put processes in place for your business so that you can actually write job descriptions for it so that some, at some point you can walk away from it. This is, the, this is the problem with most mom and pop businesses. They're trying to do everything. They don't have a well-structured process in their business. It's really important that you do that. And that's... That's kind of what I brought to this farm, but only so that I could do all the other things I really wanted to, <laughs> right? So that I could actually have the freedoms to walk away from it, have a farm manager there to run it, and then get engaged in the projects to give back, to build oyster reefs, plant eel grass, and, and make, a, make a difference. Man, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I love the way, yeah, I love the way you're looking at it. I'm excited to see how the project continues to grow and how your community's changed. Just again, I always love to highlight how one person can truly have a large impact on their community. So Keith, thanks for taking the time, man. I really enjoyed it. Please come up to Maine and come out on the farm with me and meet the farmers who are around me. They're just awesome people. I mean, you definitely throughout this show, you definitely sold it well. Like I haven't, I've hardly, I spent time in uh, New Jersey, New York. I was hardly ever up there. It sounds, it sounds great. All right. Cool, man. Thank you. All right, everybody. You're welcome, man. All right, everybody. See you soon. Take care. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Changing the Climate. Here at Climate Change Realty, we don't just donate 50% of our net commissions to fight climate change. We also donate a full 50% of our real estate referrals. 
So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrboulder.com today.